venture um, and we've cloud work really really well together to deliver all of these uh, capabilities um, and my name is Luke Marsden I work uh, on developer experience at Weaveworks and also presenting today is going to be Bill Maxwell uh, from Rancher Labs um, so um, the first section is going to be done by Bill um, and so I'll, I'll hand over to him Thanks, Luke. Okay. All right, and hopefully you can see my screen now. Okay. So I'm Bill Maxwell. I'm from uh, Rancher Labs, and um, you know, for those kind of coming to Rancher or not quite familiar with what we do, um, we provide we have three main products. Uh, the flagship product is our our Rancher management solution, and it's designed and aimed at managing containers in production um, and allowing you to build your own container as a service type platform and. You can leverage uh, Rancher natively, um, or you can deploy and manage Kubernetes, and and really it just gives you a lot of options to run uh, containers in production. We've also got Rancher OS, which is a lightweight uh, ran uh, operating Linux distribution that uh, runs Docker as a native uh, PID one, and so with that you're able to easily launch containers um, you know, through Compose and kind of familiar Docker tools on startup. And we've also recently announced uh, Project Longhorn, and this one's still pretty early, but uh, developing. This is our um, uh, block storage solution that is uh, built around the concept of microservices. So each volume is sort of its own um, you know, little microservice, uh, and it can use different orchestrators to uh, provision that so um, check that project out and uh, yeah and so if we look at Rancher um, you know, making it completely easy to run containers in production you know just getting a container up and running is, is you know sort of the first step in development but really once you put it out into Production. There's so many other considerations. There's the networking, the underlying storage components, and how do you route traffic? Um, you know, and that's that's where Rancher kind of comes in, and um, you know, also being able to leverage Kubernetes and the uh, infrastructure management capabilities underneath that. And so, when you're able to um, deliver these tools through containers, um, we also provide this catalog interface that makes it super simple as a service delivery organization to kind of consume uh, these resources. And really, you know, some of these orchestration systems are fairly complex and involve a lot to get up and running, and, and Rancher simplifies the delivery of that. So you're very um, quickly able to get up and running with Rancher and, uh, and Kubernetes. And so, um, you're able to leverage these tools. Uh, yeah. And so just kind of rancher in the Kubernetes story is you know we we provide kind of the you know a package managed solution for the lifecycle of Kubernetes. So um, you know we deploy and manage the Kubernetes infrastructure, the etcd, the API servers, adding and removing of nodes. Um, we just simplify that and then we deliver it through our own catalog delivery mechanism, and so we provide the upgrade path, uh, which is you know, vetted and QA'd at every release. And since you know Docker and uh, you know, Kubernetes, uh, you, they really allow you to run on Linux in just any cloud, and so Rancher does. And so we can also deliver Kubernetes in a similar fashion, um, being able to run you know anywhere there's that you're able to run containers. And you know, we provide a 100% open source solution, and so you're able to see what Rancher's doing, uh, contribute, um, you know, and then you know, also get uh, support from Rancher, and um, you know, it's a supported platform. And then you really, once you've deployed uh, Rancher, getting up and running with Kubernetes is, is, is a matter of minutes. Um, and so I'm gonna show you that uh, now. 
So here I've got a um, a rancher stack uh, or deployment, and so there's just uh, a rancher management server. And I'll just start with a quick high-level overview that your rancher manages um, environments, which are just kind of think of them as a collection of resources that you can apply access control to, um, and also sort of the scope of uh, any of the orchestrators. And so Rancher does support multiple orchestrators. Um, you know, it supports its native cattle and uh, Kubernetes, um, uh, and a, uh, it has support for the other, uh, a couple others as well. And so when you create in your environment, you can kind of pick your orchestrator, um, you know, Kubernetes and Mesos or Swarm, and uh, also assign access controls and the, the owners and members, and you can assign just different levels of access to each of these environments. And when you create one, um, you, know, you can look at the default here is the host. Um, you, you just end up with uh, an infrastructure view with where your hosts are, and you can see those, and then your stacks view. Um, the first thing you'll do is add hosts. Um, and with that, we, we give you several different options. If you've already you know, invested time and money into a provisioning system for building hosts, at the end of that system, you just need to run this Docker command, and then that host will automatically register back into this environment. Um, or uh, you can leverage our built-in um, uh, access to the machine drivers. So we've got Amazon uh, EC2 uh, DigitalOcean packet and a few others, and you can customize these and add additional. Um, and once you've added a host, um, you can also then kind of clone it. So, you know, typically you want to add a few hosts to your environment. Um, so give it some names. Select your size. Um, and you can customize different elements of this. And so I'll create a new host. Sort of while that one's what this is doing is under the hood, Docker machine is going and adding a host to this environment. So while it's doing that, I've got another environment that I've provisioned um, with some hosts already. So this is three hosts, and they're running just the rancher management stack. Um, I started this environment as a cattle environment. Um, I could have started it as a Kubernetes environment, but I wanted to show you uh, the catalog as well. Um, so this is the Rancher um, library catalog. There's also the community catalog, which has a bunch of uh, applications that have been contributed by the community for running on top of uh, our cattle orchestrator. We'll go and look at the library. And so these are the tools that Rancher delivers through the catalog um, mechanism. And so we've got our Kubernetes stack. It's currently running the 166 version. Um, and we give you some flexibility on how you want to deploy uh, your Kubernetes um, installation. So by default, it just kind of deploys it as best, or uh, just across all the hosts in the environment, and um, you know it just sort of deploys it uh, in a sort of an not unpredictable, but uh, a way that just scheduled and the resources are mixed. So workload and uh, control plane are um, are mixed. If you don't want that, um, you can set these labels uh, on the hosts, compute, orchestration, etcd, and sort of control where those services run. And by doing that, you flip on this uh, plain isolation requirement. I'm going to leave it off for now, but uh, you can also pick your different cloud providers. Since we're going to be running this on Amazon, we'll enable the AWS cloud providers. So that just lets you use the AWS tool. Um, you know, built-in AWS functionality of Kubernetes. Um, and then you have some other options sort of for customizing it, but we'll stick with the default for now. And so now Rancher is going out and deploying all of the uh, Kubernetes components. And so if we take a look, make sure the system containers, you can see etcd is being deployed in a three-node uh, fashion across all of the clusters or all of the nodes in the cluster. So that's coming up. 
You can see that the header sort of changes once you've um, uh, added Kubernetes. And so as the stacks deploy, you get um, these infrastructure views. And so one of the things we do as part of uh, the Kubernetes deployments, uh, by default, we deploy a bunch of the add-ons. So we deploy like Heapster, uh, Helm, um, and the Kubernetes dashboard. So that kind of gives you like a comprehensive um, Kubernetes you know, experience out of the box and uh, all of the tools you need to sort of really leverage um, Kubernetes uh, from a orchestration standpoint. So this is coming up. So as it does, and so you, know, you can come and manage things through the UI. Um, So while this is going, do we have any questions that are have come in yet? Uh, yeah, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, first off, um, let's see. Um, well, I see some of these questions have come up. Uh, we're going to answer as many of these as we can on the side. Um, there are some other questions around how Rancher um, if we install add-ons or um, change settings once the environment itself is deployed, um, are you able to uh, talk talk about how you can manage a, a little bit while this is booting up some of the ways you can manage a Kubernetes cluster as it's uh, being deployed, or excuse me, once it's up and running? Yeah. So so once the cluster is up and running, um, you you have full access to Kubernetes. Um, and so things are up and, uh, and going. So if you were to have deployed it without the add-ons, um, you should be able to do a, like a, a read. You click on, uh, this is just, I think I might have gone with too small of an instance size. Um, so when you, when you have that going, it's, um, you can redeploy the catalog entry or just kind of click on the, on the stacks page, there's like an up to date button, and that gives you the opportunity to sort of customize the um, the configuration of the plane uh, of the application. What I wouldn't recommend doing is going um, from a, um, from a, the required plane isolation to not or back in, you know I wouldn't make that switch on a in place upgrade. I would I would probably do a migration. Um, but for the add-ons, I believe that uh, you should be able to kind of shut it off and turn it back on or one way or the other. Um, yeah, I think that answers that question. Okay, great. Um, so it looks like we're still waiting for some things to spin up here. Um, I know that we might be uh, running a little bit uh, behind schedule right now. Um, Bill, what's the next thing that uh, you would want to show here? So what I would be showing is the, uh, the Kubernetes, just that you can interact with it uh, via the command line, or you can interact with it via the uh, Kubernetes dashboard. And then 
at that point, uh, we'll be handing it off to Luke, who I believe has a running Rancher Kubernetes installation. So um, I think we could probably get a good view of that through this demo. Okay. Uh, maybe we should hand things uh, back to Luke then and uh, try and keep some things on schedule. Is that all right with you, Luke? Yeah, sounds great. Um, okay. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, th thank you very much, Bill. Um, that was fantastic. And, um, yeah, there's a bit in my demo where we get to see um, some, of the, uh, some of the bits that you weren't able to show there, including the, the CLI. Um, so, uh, so we'll get to those a little bit later. Um, so hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Um, and um, so I'm just going to run through a few slides and, um, uh, and then I'll, I've got my own demo at the end of the session as well. Um, and um, in the middle, uh, I've got some, some material here that talks about some of the theory behind Prometheus, which hopefully will be interesting to, um, to some people in the audience here. Um, because that's really what I wanted to focus on in this session is, is about the monitoring aspect. Um, so, um, so anyway, given that you have uh, Rancher um, deploying Kubernetes, why would you want to use Rancher together with Weaveworks or, or uh, Weave Cloud, which is the, the product that we have at Weaveworks? Um, well, the short answer is that, that Rancher gets you a Kubernetes um, in a way that is enterprise ready. Uh, it deploys all the, all the good bits that you need. Um, it's uh, highly available. Um, it, it's upgradable. And that's what I really like about Rancher. You just give it some nodes and it does all the hard work of setting up and managing the entire Kubernetes lifecycle for you. Um, the, where we come in with, with the Weaveworks tools is that Kubernetes on its own uh, misses out some tools that are needed to do what I call closing the loop. And I'll show you a picture of the loop in a minute so that this becomes clearer and more concrete. Um, but specifically, those tools are around deployment. It's this idea that you can plug the output of a CI system into your cluster so that you can ship features faster. Um, it's about exploring so that you can visualize and understand what's going on um, in your cluster. And it's about monitoring, which is where I'm going to focus most of the time today, um, which is all about understanding the behavior of a running system so that you can fix problems faster. And in particular, with monitoring, we've gone all in on Prometheus, um, which is a, a very popular open source uh, monitoring solution um, that's become very popular in both the Docker and Kubernetes ecosystems. Um, cool. So. Uh, with that said, let me show you a picture of this loop I was talking about. Um, so this loop is basically is the software development lifecycle. So up here at the top, uh, we have developers. Uh, and down here at the bottom, we have users. And the idea of uh, all of this infrastructure stuff that we're doing is about um, allowing your development team to ship features to your users and fix problems when they happen so that your users get the best possible experience. And so this is for you, um, the, hopefully the, the user of Rancher, the user of Docker and Kubernetes and Prometheus um, to, to help you um, uh, understand and, and push changes around this loop as quickly as possible. So hopefully some of this seems familiar. So the first thing that this development team, uh, that your development team needs to be able to do is to ship features as quickly as possible. And so in this diagram here, we have the green star represents a new feature, which at this point might just be an idea. Um, then your development team take that feature and they turn it into code. Um, and, at which, and at this point, they push that code to a version control system. And then you probably have a CI system uh, build a new container image from that version of the code and then uh, uh, push that container image to a container registry. Notice, by the way, that everything outside the dotted line in this diagram is outside of the scope of, of Weave Cloud. Um, and everything inside the dotted line is, is something that we are offering to take responsibility uh, for um, with our product. So the important thing here is, like, obviously, you bring your own developer team, you bring your own application, but you also bring your own CI system and your own container registry. And what's more, uh, also outside this dotted line down here, uh, you bring your own Kubernetes cluster. And um, that's where we would recommend using Rancher um, along with Weave Cloud um, as a, a fantastic way of, of getting that Kubernetes cluster spun up and providing something that's production ready, like I said, upgradable and, and, and easy to use. So anyway, back to this feature that we're trying to get into production. So this feature is now sitting in the container registry um, 
and it is uh, ready to be deployed into your production cluster, perhaps. So this is the first uh, tool that comes into play with Weave Cloud is uh, this deploy feature. So the deploy feature can basically take this container image, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute, um, and safely push that container image into your production cluster while simultaneously version controlling that change. So you have version controlled config. Now, once that change has landed in production, obviously uh, you might need to be able to roll it back. That's one of the features that we can uh, provide with, with this deploy feature. But um, presuming that you, you don't need to roll it back, your feature is now in production um, and, um, and your users are, are probably happy. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is that your development team need to be able to fix problems as fast as possible as and when they come up. So this red star now represents a problem on your production cluster. Uh, maybe your monitoring system is alerting you to a problem. That's one of the features that we provide in, in Weave Cloud, for example. Or maybe you have users who are complaining about an issue. So what we help you with is taking this problem and then um, using these two tools here to understand the problem and help you fix the problem. So the first tool is uh, this explore feature and the other tool, which is currently hidden by the red star is this monitoring feature. Um, and the reason that there are two Prometheus logos here, by the way, is that we run a version of Prometheus in Weave Cloud. And you, we also recommend that users run a local uh, version of Prometheus. And basically what we do is we, we recommend that you configure this local Prometheus instance to ship metrics up to Weave Cloud because we'll handle storing them for you. And anyway, so the, the challenge now for this development team faced with this problem in production is to turn this red star uh, into a green star, i.e. a code change or a configuration change. Um, so they've identified, the development team at this stage has identified what the problem is and figured out how to fix it. And then at this point, the, the name of the game is to ship this code or configuration change back around the loop as quickly as you possibly can. And the basic value proposition with Weave Cloud is that your uh, competitiveness as a software team is a direct function of how fast you can go around this loop. Okay, so with that said, um, let's uh, shift gears a little bit, and I'm now going to talk about Prometheus and give you some of the background um, on Prometheus, uh, which is um, the monitoring solution that, that I'm going to spend most of today talking about and showing you. Um, now, I like to say that um, uh, Kubernetes is to Borg as Prometheus is to Borgmon. Now, if you've never worked at Google, that might be a bit of a confusing thing to say, so let me explain what I mean. Um, Borg is the container scheduler that uh, was developed um, at Google, um, and it's how Google run billions of containers a day, apparently, uh, in production. And Borgmon is the system that they developed uh, to monitor applications when they're running in Borg. Now, Kubernetes, of course, is the open source project that came out of a bunch of smart Google engineers wanting to make the capabilities of Borg available to the rest of the world. Um, and in a similar way, you can think of Prometheus as being in, as a project that was inspired by the structure and the way that Borgmon uh, worked. Um, and in fact, it was developed by a couple of ex-Google engineers who were working together um, at a little startup you might have heard of called SoundCloud um, that's based in Berlin. Um, so a little bit about um, Prometheus and its data model. So uh, this gets a little bit technical. I hope people are up for that. Um, Prometheus is a labeled time series database, basically. Um, and the labels uh, in the time series database are just key value pairs. Now, immediately, this might start sounding a bit familiar because uh, um, labels in Kubernetes are also a, um, a big deal. And that's not a coincidence. Um, obviously, Prometheus was heavily inspired by um, by the sort of structure of, uh, of Borg and Borgmon, um, where that was also, uh, where labeling, labeling things and using labels and selectors is a, is a common pattern. Um, okay, so you have labels, which are key value pairs um, that you associate with a time series. And then a time series itself is just a list of timestamp value tuples. So you can think of this uh, like saying, um, at time one, the value was this, and at time two, the value was that, and so on. Um, and everything that goes in these values, uh, they're just floats. They're 64-bit floating point numbers. Uh, but using floats, you can represent uh, counters, gauges, or histograms, um, and a few other types as well. Um, and what I mean by those, they're, they're different types of ways of thinking about 
data that you might want to monitor. Um, counters are um, always going up. Um, so for example, an example of a counter would be something like, um, uh, an example of a counter would be maybe um, the number of requests that have been made to a web server. Um, and that would always be increasing. So that it's monotonically increasing, um, apart from if the process restarts or if you hit the maximum value of a 64-bit float, uh, then you'll get uh, looped back down to zero. Um, but apart from that, counters are always going up and to the right. Gauges, on the other hand, um, you can think of a little bit like a thermometer in a room. Um, so um, a thermometer might say um, that it's uh, at, at 10 a.m. it was uh, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And then at uh, 12 a.m. it was 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And then at 4 p.m. it was 80 degrees Fahrenheit again. Um, and if you were sampling the thermometer uh, less frequently than what I just described, you might miss the fact that um, the temperature spiked up to 90 and then went back down to 80. So gauges can be kind of lossy in that way. Um, you, can, you can miss out um, some uh, peaks and troughs in, in, the, in the changes. Whereas counters, even though you might lose some resolution, you'll always get the, the correct sort of value at each point in time when you, uh, when you sample it. Uh, histograms are a little bit more complicated. Um, they um, have a, um, uh, basically the idea is that you can have a set of buckets um, and every time you make a, you record a sample, for example, how long was a request to an API server, uh, then you just uh, increment the counter in one of the buckets and then Prometheus uh, can sort of sample those over time and, and show you histograms, which are great for understanding distributions. Um, and basically the, the key here is that they're all represented as these floating point values, but PromQL, which is this language that you use to write Prometheus expressions, allows you to make sense of them. And then to summarize, so the data type of Prometheus is a set of key value pairs um, for labels. So key one is A, key two is B, mapped onto a list of um, uh, timestamp value tuples. Um, and of course, uh, in the Prometheus database, you would have many of these things. And so I'll show you some concrete examples in a minute. There's just one other thing you need to know about labels, uh, which is that there's a special label called double underscore name double underscore, uh, which means that you can, if, you, if you're looking for uh, things that match name, you can actually just write the PromQL expression requests rather than the curly braces and, and double underscore name double underscore. And this just is sort of uh, syntactic sugar. It makes it nicer to look at. Um, okay, so I talked about uh, requests uh, hitting a web server earlier. So here in this example that I'm going to use, um, we're having uh, one request a second. Let's assume the sample rate is once a second. So we're seeing one request a second every second because it's going one, two, three. It's increasing by one each time. And then for the next, ten, for the next three seconds, it's increasing by 10 requests a second. Uh, and then for the final three seconds, it's increasing only for one request a second. Um, so uh, you might then um, see the data in this format, one, two, three, 13, 23, 33. Um, mapping the timestamps um, onto, onto the values like this. Um, and so when you see this data, what's actually happening on the inside um, is that um, we're seeing uh, name uh, mapping onto requests, is mapping onto this list of uh, timestamp um, value tuples. Um, okay, so another piece of PromQL syntax that you need to understand um, is that there's a period uh, syntax that you can put after a label or, or any expression that's like a selector that matches uh, some values. Um, and it turns this sort of instant type um, into a vector type. And um, what I mean by that is that for each value, it turns the value into a vector, which is like a list um, of all the values before and including that value um, for that last period. So for example, um, a period of five seconds would um, uh, make each value into a list of values that over those last five seconds, or you can have a value of a minute or two hours and, and so on. Um, and this, um, this idea will make more sense uh, when, I, when I show you a concrete example. So remember we had this sort of requests value here, uh, the, or this requests um, uh, time series um, that went 1, 2, 3, 13, 23, 33, et cetera. Um, the requests over three seconds gives you this table. So it says 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 13, uh, 3, 13, 23. And so what you can see here is that as we go along, it's sort of chunking along um, uh, the, uh, the, 
this um, this table at each point and sort of filling in uh, this this data. And so this table is then useful because um, you can then take uh, requests over three seconds. You can think of this, by the way, as sort of a moving window. Um, and um, you can then use the rate function um, on this uh, on this vector query to find the per second rate of change. Um, and rate just does last value minus first value over last time minus first time, um, which I'll give you an example of here. So we're taking the last value minus the first value, which is two, and we're dividing it by the last time minus the first time, which is two. And so we get a value of one um, for the first three seconds, which is good because we, what I said at the beginning was that our data in this example is changing um, at uh, one per second. Um, then we can do the same thing here. Um, and we actually get 5.5. And then here we get 10. Uh, we get 10 again, and 5.5, and 1, and 1. Um, and so what we've done here is that we've effectively differentiated the data, if you're into math. Um, we found the rate of change of the data over, over time using this sort of numerical method. Um, and so visually what we've done here is that we've taken this, uh, this expression counter, which gives you this sort of um, <clears throat> this value that's always going up and to the right. And by the way, I didn't say earlier, it, it's kind of useless to look at this data. It, you'd have to squint at it and look at the gradient of the line to understand anything about like how, um, how the request rate to your web server was changing over time. Um, so what we do is we take the counter, we, um, apply a moving, uh, we apply a moving window to it, let's say three seconds. This turns it into a table. Um, and then we apply this rate function uh, which just sort of differentiates the data, so it finds the rate of change of that data over time. Um, now, um, of course, uh, requests is just shorthand for name equals requests, but you can also add more labels in there. So it's common in, Pr in Prometheus uh, to label things with a job. Um, so a job might be that there's um, an API server, and there's a front end, and there's a user's server, and a date and a database and, and various other microservices in your application. And a job would just be a descriptive name for uh, what kind of thing that was attached to. And then, of course, you can shorten this requests uh, value to requests where the job equals the front end. Um, and then you can query the rate of change of the request uh, rates, um, sorry, the rate of change of requests to the front end job over a one minute moving average. And that's sort of how you would pronounce this, this PromQL query. Um, and um, yeah, so um, that's all the content I've got on, on PromQL. If you have any questions, please uh, throw them in the chat. And if we have time at the end, um, uh, I'll, I'll take a look at them. Um, OK, so then um, just a little bit about Prometheus. Um, there is a, uh, this diagram is just from the Prometheus readme on GitHub. Um, there's uh, lots going on in this diagram. But what I really want to point out from this diagram is that there's a Prometheus server here, um, and it pulls metrics. Uh, from jobs, i.e. from your microservices. And the key point there is that it's a pull-based system. So you don't have these jobs running here pushing metrics into your Prometheus server, but rather you have um, Prometheus going out and scraping uh, those metrics endpoints on your jobs. Um, and what's more, Prometheus can go and talk to, uh, for example, Kubernetes API um, to, to do service discovery. And that's how it finds out what things to scrape. Um, cool. And um, if I had more time, I'd go more into the architecture, but maybe we can cover it in the questions. Um, all I want to say about the Prometheus that we've baked into Weave Cloud is that the Prometheus that you see here, the open source Prometheus, only runs on a single machine at a time. Um, you have a single Prometheus server that runs on a single machine with a single disk. And if you want something that's scalable and highly available, uh, then as you know, um, that architecture isn't really going to cut it. So what we did is we developed this project called Cortex, um, which is an open source project, which is a distributed multi-tenant version of Prometheus. And then baked into Weave Cloud, we run um, a Cortex instance for you, a very big scalable one. Um, so you can basically throw as many metrics as you like at this thing, and it will handle all of them, and it will scale well. Um, and uh, it means that you don't need to worry about long-term storage of your metrics, which is, which is nice. Cool. OK. Um, so that's all the sort of theory uh, side of things that I've got. Um, uh, now I'm going to show you a demo. So uh, what I did 
uh, was I spun up a uh, rancher cluster um, earlier on today, um, just uh, just like Bill just did, just like Bill just showed. And so what you should be able to see here, sorry if the text is a little bit small, but hopefully what you should be able to see is that we have um, five nodes in this Kubernetes cluster running inside Rancher. Um, and uh, Rancher has helpfully installed um, these, uh, installed Kubernetes on these machines. Um, I provisioned them on AWS using the built-in AWS provisioner um, in, in Rancher. And of course, Rancher has made it possible and easy uh, to upgrade those um, uh, those things and um, uh, to be able to easily um, manage them. So, um, uh, sorry, just a second. Um, sorry, I've just got a problem with my screen. Um, Uh, I'll just share my screen again. Sorry, one second. Uh, my computer's crunching. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, in the meantime, we've actually gotten a few questions about uh, whether things will work on GCP as well. Um, I think for both uh, Rancher and uh, Weave Cloud. Um, so maybe we can answer that if, uh, you know, whether or not we have to be tied specifically to uh, AWS or if there's other clouds um, or infrastructure. But yeah, great have... question. Um, so um, I, um, I believe that, um, I, I think that's more of a Rancher question actually, although uh, there's nothing stopping you um, running Kubernetes on any cloud. Um, and uh, and all of the stuff I'm I'm going to show here with Prometheus and so on uh, will uh, will work great um, on um, on any cloud because we are actually running Weave Cloud as a SaaS product as a SaaS service. So you just ship your metrics to it from wherever you're running uh, from wherever you're running your cluster. Um, cool. So um, yeah, I think my computer's behaving a bit better now. So if I just try and share my screen again, can you can you see my screen now? Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Um, okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So like I was saying, we've got a Kubernetes cluster here uh, that's helpfully been spun up uh, by Rancher. Uh, Rancher has gone ahead and installed uh, Kubernetes on these five nodes that I provisioned. Um, using um, uh, using Kubernetes, uh, sorry, using Rancher. Um, but uh, my computer has now frozen again. So um, let me just see um, what's going on here. Okay. Um, I'm going to come clean. I'm actually trying to show a video here. Uh, which I recorded earlier, and um, it seems like it's misbehaving when I try and show it while I'm sharing my screen at the same time. So um, let me just see if I can use a different piece of software to play the video. Um, maybe it would help if I came out of here. Um, continue. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what's up with this. It's just um, this was working great earlier when I tried it. So let me just quick time. Maybe quick time will work. Okay. Um, You're getting some sympathy in the questions. The demo okay. gods are brutal. <laughs> yeah, the demo gods are brutal today. They have not been kind to either of us. <laughs> uh, however, uh, this actually seems to the screen seems to be updating now. <laughs> um, so I can proceed with the with, with the demo. Um, I believe. It, can 
can you just confirm you can see my screen working? Yeah, I, I can see your screen. It's I see uh, okay. the awesome. right okay. so, so, so we're on. Um, so fantastic. We have um, uh, we've cloud here, uh, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to install. Um, uh, to install Rancher, uh, to install Weave Cloud on, on Rancher. Um, so basically, what all I did there was, um, so I had a, a, a Rancher, a Kubernetes cluster that was created by Rancher. Um, I was able to, um, to do that quickly and easily using the Rancher interface. Um, I can then go into the Kubernetes tab uh, in Rancher and click on the CLI. And then that uh, gets me a shell where I just copy and paste this short command from Weave Cloud um, into the shell, and um, if I hit enter there, oh, then that's um, instantly... Sorry, uh, Luke, we're getting a comment uh, saying that um, I think your screen might be paused. Are you able to hit play on your screen again and uh, make sure that... Uh, I, I think uh, all we see right now is the Rancher hosts itself. I'm not sure what the right screen we should be seeing right now is. Okay. Um, so... Are you able to see the Weave Cloud interface right now, for example? Uh, no. Ah, OK. Well, so I guess what we've learned from this is that uh, GoToMeeting doesn't support streaming video that I'm playing. <laughs> <on my computer>. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, uh, we can. So sorry about that. Yeah, I so there's a question. Probably, probably what's best is if we share a, a link to the video with everyone who attended today after, because I already prepared a four minute video um, that includes this demo. Um, so we can just maybe we can just mail that out to everyone afterwards. Yes, yeah, we can absolutely follow up with that okay. afterwards. Well, sorry about that, everyone. Um, but um, yeah, let's just take some questions then, uh, if people have questions. Uh, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, for folks that uh, do have questions about uh, either Weave Cloud or Rancher, we encourage you to. Um, uh, type them into the questions panel, um, and we'll start getting through um, a reasonable number of these before closing up in a few minutes. Um, Bill, are you um, able to answer some of these questions around installing Rancher on Google Cloud? Yeah, so you can so you can install it on Google Cloud, um, but the underlying cloud provider pieces are not supported by Rancher at this point. Um, just due to, I believe there was uh, some networking issues integrating it directly into um, Google Cloud. Um, that said, though, you can deploy Kubernetes. Um, you know, our stack does deploy on on all the infrastructure as long as there's Linux and Docker, and it'll be a functioning Kubernetes cluster where that sort of you know, the, where, where the, the capabilities that aren't supported then are like the ability to attach uh, block storage or leverage their um, their load balancers uh, using native Kubernetes um, providers. Okay, great. Um, we got another question on how does Weave, uh, does Weave integrate with webhooks in Rancher? Um, I will ask that one to Luke and to Bill. <laughs> Um, probably with you first, Luke. Uh, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head um, exactly which webhooks we would integrate with. Um, I know that the sort of the integration points um, for uh, for Weave Cloud's capabilities are um, in the. Um, uh, what if I just pull back this? Uh, let me see here. Um, there's an architecture diagram uh, sort of here. Um, um, can you, um, are you sure your screen isn't paused, actually? Because I think we're still missing the architectural diagram. All we see right now still is the host screen. Yeah. Well, you're okay, looking at well, that. The, the, um, the Weave Cloud has the, uh, the ability to provision and kind of configure the uh, alert manager for Prometheus. So if you were monitoring and watching statistics um, for various uh, Symptom or not symptoms, but performance-related metrics, for instance, um, like response times, or if you were looking at number of requests, uh, and you configured the alert manager with the webhook um, notifier receiver, um, you could configure that to point to Rancher uh, for auto scaling of hosts or auto scaling of the, um, in this case, probably the hosts, and then. Um, 
you can use the native Kubernetes bits for um, auto scaling of the pods, but uh, you could watch for characteristics um, that would require sort of host scaling um, for sure. Yeah, that would be a, a cool integration. Yeah, so so exactly. If um, uh, Wave Cloud's alerting feature can configure um, can, can send alerts via any mechanism supported by Alert Manager. So uh, so yeah, webhooks would be one of those, and that would be a really cool thing to see. Okay, uh, we've got another question on multi-tenancy. Um, can each of you guys uh, speak to how you guys handle multi-tenancy on your respective platforms? Um, Bill, I think the specific question on Rancher is uh, whether we can run multiple um, Kubernetes clusters uh, within Rancher, um, which we can, but I'll let you uh, speak to that a bit more. Yeah, so right now the, um, the tenant is the, is the environment in Rancher. Um, and so that is a collection of, of hosts and resources, and you can apply access controls to those. Um, with that, a, a host can only belong to a single environment at this point. Um, I think, I'm not sure if it's in the latest 1.6.5 or if it's coming soon, but we are um, working to expose, in the Kubernetes cluster, we're working to expose some of the RBAC capabilities underlying Kubernetes. Um, and so with that, you'll be able to uh, you know, leverage um, some of the Rancher authentication bits uh, at, in, within Kubernetes, so you can kind of restrict, um, or you can use the RBAC in Kubernetes as well. Great. Um, and Luke, can you speak to how you would handle multiple clusters or tenants um, in LeafCloud? Yeah, definitely. So um, in uh, so, so Weave Cloud itself is a multi-tenant system, of course, because we have we support multiple users. Um, uh, multiple people can sign up at the same time, and, and that multi-tenancy goes all the way through the system. So, um, and multiple and individual users can also have multiple what we call instances inside Weave Cloud, um, and those instances um, can um, they typically correspond to an individual cluster. So, you'd have one. Uh, cluster per instance. So, for example, for our own production cluster on on AWS, um, or for our own setup, we have a production cluster on AWS, which is in one, in one Weave Cloud instance, and uh, a staging cluster also in AWS, which is on another Weave Cloud instance. And all the data that's sent for each instance is uh, specific; um, it is sort of partitioned within the system, um, so that uh, it's sort of isolated from all the other instances. So yeah, uh, multi-tenancy all the way down. Okay, great. Um, I think we've got time for just a couple more questions here. Um, I've got another question about uh, new machines with Rancher and how um, one is it's possible to uh, have automatic provisioning of new machines within Rancher. Um, and Bill, I'll let you handle that one. And then uh, Luke, I think we should also speak to how you handle uh, the addition of new machines as you're doing your monitoring as well. Sure. Um, so. Rancher adding new machines. Um, if you're using Rancher's machine driver uh, implementation, and then um, you can use our webhook to you know, scale up and scale down the number of hosts in an environment um, based on some sort of external uh, capability. And as those machines come in, um, you can control what they do um, based on host labels. So um, if you want, and depending on how you've scheduled and planned your services. So in the, in the context of the Kubernetes cluster, there's um, three primary labels that, that dictate what um, services get deployed on the host. So you can isolate the control plane, so etcd and the uh, API server and, and, and the uh, Kubernetes management stack can be isolated to a, a unique set of hosts and then you bring in compute nodes with the label compute equals true, um, and then as those come in, they get the um, the Kubelet deployed, and then they get added to the cluster, and so you'll start seeing those um, through the Kubernetes uh, API as, as nodes that are available for scheduling. Um, you know, the, and so, or if they, they don't have any labels, then they just come in as generic hosts, and as things need them, they get uh, deployed. So if all the management's services are deployed to full scale, 
you know, they'll just come in and they'll get the, the Kubernetes managed, uh, Kubelet deployed and they'll just kind of come in as workers, but they also are candidates to take on uh, management tasks as well, their services. Uh, hopefully that answers that. Cool, yeah, and I can answer also from a sort of Weave Cloud slash Prometheus perspective. Um, uh, and the answer is that when, with respect to adding hosts, I mean, it works really well uh, with, with the Rancher approach where you just throw more nodes at the cluster and the cluster can expand to, to, to support them. Um, because uh, Prometheus is uh, learning what um, to scrape from uh, the uh, Kubernetes API, um, it will go and uh, and discover new services that are running on new machines without any additional configuration of the monitoring system at all. So the monitoring system doesn't need to be aware or manually configured in any way to to know that uh, new machines have come up. Um, it can just go ahead and uh, and start scraping new services running on new machines automatically. Um, and the same is true also of the visual, visualization tool in Weave Cloud, which unfortunately I didn't get a chance to show you. Um, but um, but that also just it just uses a daemon set um, in, in Kubernetes to make sure that, that uh, all of those agents that are needed uh, to provide the functionality are running on all of the machines. Cool, great. Um, yeah, I think we're about out of time. Uh, do you want to finish us up, Luke? I don't really have anything else to add apart from thank you everyone <laughs> for coming um, and thank you so much Rancher for, uh, for, for hosting this and, and letting me uh, uh, be a, a guest presenter um, and that uh, we'll get that video of, of my demo out um, with, with the follow-up emails. So, so thank you everyone. Thanks for coming. Yeah, oh, thank and you. Uh, try out <laughs> Rancher at rancher.com and try out weave cloud at weave.works. Great. Thank you everyone.